so welcome everyone and thank you uh, for coming uh, this morning. Uh, before I begin, uh, let me again, uh, for on behalf of all of us, uh, say uh, thank you to the uh, people uh, uh, who come early, who clean, who set up, who clean the cushions and the bathrooms. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice we can just come in and uh, settle in, uh, but I want to certainly acknowledge the people uh, uh, in many ways who contribute to uh, the, the maintenance of the center here. Uh, we are a totally volunteer organization, uh, and we rely on the, uh, the goodness uh, of members and non-members uh, uh, to maintain it. This is really a community, and these are our, these are our uh, this is our home. And so uh, I appreciate the people uh, who uh, take care of it. I also appreciate uh, personally <laughs> uh, a number of the people uh, in our community uh, who are really just taking care of lots of things uh, uh, these days. I mean, I know there was a, a day of mind, a half day of mindfulness yesterday, uh, which I heard when I came in today was quite. Uh, uh, well attended and everything was quite good uh, but I realized I didn't even know anything about it I mean I think I knew that it was happening I didn't I didn't know who was giving the talks or anything and so that was quite wonderful uh, for me to ma it made me happy to know that uh, the community is growing in that way and there are many more people uh, taking care of things I know there was a uh, a uh, Buddhism or meditation and science uh, uh, a thing earlier in the week, uh, a class on vegetarian cooking, <laughs> uh, lots of uh, interesting things. Uh, Brian is uh, working with his wake-up group uh, uh, for younger people. So again, there's just a lot, and there will be a lot more going on. And it's wonderful that, uh, again, there's so much uh, participation. And over the coming uh, years, I hope uh, more people who have, uh, who have interests and skills and competencies and knowledge in certain areas uh, will feel uh, uh, happy to share them uh, with the wider community. So before I begin uh, the formal talk, uh, I realized I haven't, I usually uh, used to start out more regularly uh, taking questions. Uh, so let me just say, if there's anybody here, and please don't be uh, shy, uh, new or old, uh, who has any questions about uh, you know what we do here, the practices we did here this morning, uh, or, even, uh, or even more important, uh, in your life. Uh, in your uh, in your readings, in your study, in your practice, and your desire to uh, uh, to bring the teachings and the practices uh, into your life uh, to facilitate real healing, transformation. Uh, sometimes uh, it's not clear; you know, the way is not clear. Uh, so, if anybody has any questions, yes, sir. When you bow to the and and your name is oh, Dean. Yes, Dean. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. So that's a good point. Many of us grew up in traditions where uh, bowing before graven images or idols was a, was, was a major no-no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a good question. And, and, and probably in answering it, uh, it's, it's probably more subtler than uh, we could imagine. Uh, again, uh, for for quite a while after the uh, death of the Buddha in India, uh, there were no representations of him. For a while, he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, an historical figure that had not died too many generations ago, so he was still in the uh, popular vernacular uh, of his age. Uh, but over time, as people wanted to re remember him uh, more, the teachings, uh, there were representations. And the early representations were things like lotuses or like the Dharma wheel, uh, which is representative of the teaching, uh, footprints, imprints of his foot. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it was really quite interestingly, you know, Buddhism uh, spread quite widespread. Uh, we know about it spread in Asia, but it also spread uh, countries like Afghanistan uh, into Iran, in place Pakistan, uh, where, where strong centers of Buddhism. And uh, it was in Buddhism's uh, going uh, west and really um, uh, encountering the Gandhara, uh, you know, the Greek civilization had also been coming east. 
And it was really the Greeks who were, as anybody who goes to museums know, uh, were quite uh, wonderful in their representation of, uh, of, uh, of gods and human forms and other types of things. Uh, so it was really uh, in the Gandhara or in that uh, movement of Buddhism uh, out of India uh, east, uh, I mean west, uh, into, and, and when I came across uh, the Hellenic cultures, that the representations, and if you look at uh, what call a Gandhara Buddhas, you know, they're very unique. As anybody seen them, you will notice they have mustaches. You know, uh, <laughs> the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas all have mustaches and they have long hair. They're quite, uh, it's interesting. I mean, they look like uh, Greeks, uh, so to speak. Uh, so again, but over the years, obviously, uh, with, with the flowering of Buddhism in Asia, uh, there was great un artistic uh, unfoldment and uh, uh, Buddha images, frescoes, paintings, I mean, you know, just were, were everywhere, not just in monasteries, caves, rocks, I mean, they just, it captured the popular imagination and the artistic imagination. Uh, but what were they? Right. I mean, obviously, uh, they are not, uh, this is not the Buddha. Uh, so to empower uh, uh, that uh, image uh, with some kind of uh, uh, power or, or something, you know, and therefore it needs to be worshipped or propitiated like an idol worship, uh, is, is, is not the case at all. Uh, it is a, a representation, right? Uh, we are human beings. And we like uh, we like to see, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, Buddha mind is for most people fairly abstract. You know, I mean, obviously we could have nothing up here. We could have a flower. Uh, we could have any anything. Uh, that, but uh, we have representations of the Buddha uh, because it uh, reminds us one of. Uh, there was a Buddha, an historical being, 2,600 years ago, who, like, uh, was a human being like us, who came to full enlightenment, right? Full enlightenment means he realized the fullest potential of what it means to be a human being, and all the, uh, the wonderful uh, capacities of our mind uh, were fully uh, developed in him. Uh, conversely, it means all the narrowness and afflictions and emotional disturbances uh, of the mind were also eradicated. He was a Buddha. So, and Buddhism began with, with him. So it is, a, it is a reminder of this connection. Sitting here on Nebraska Avenue in Tampa 2,600 years ago, that, that the, the fundamental insights that we are uh, using in our own healing and transformation and practices uh, are connected to this long tradition, 2,600 years, unbroken tradition, uh, going back to the Buddha. Uh, but even again, uh, so there's that historical connection, uh, but it also uh, reminds us uh, that each of us, because a beautiful Buddha, and I think this is a beautiful Buddha, we look for him for uh, quite a while uh, until he came our way. Uh, when we look at a at a at a at a well uh, sculpted Buddha or well painted uh, Buddha like this, there there is a presence, right? Right. There, there, we 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 see a being who is uh, solid, who is whole, who is calm. You know what I mean? There there's a certain quality. So just just having a a Buddha in the, uh, you know meditating with us, <laughs> so to speak, is, is helpful. It reminds us, you know, I mean, we could be uh, sitting here and our mind could be, you know, all over the place, or we could be fixated on something. And you look up and you see the Buddha uh, sitting so serenely, right? Continually. <laughs> He's always sitting. You know, you, you, uh, you know, you, uh, we, would, we could sneak in here at 2 a.m. in the morning just to catch him, you know, to see him. <laughs> And, uh, and, and he'd still be there like that. And that's a reminder that our true nature is like that, is always available to us. And there is this uh, intrinsic wisdom and awareness uh, always available to us. Uh, now, that is not to say 
And I just want to say this uh, for full disclosure. What's your name again? Dean. Dean. So that is not to say, Dean, uh, that over the 2,600 years of Buddhism uh, in Asia, that uh, some peoples, many peoples perhaps, uh, began to uh, invest more in the images uh, than uh, the teachings ever did. Right? And, uh, and the same way uh, human beings uh, in all various uh, types of religious traditions uh, tend to uh, fixate on, uh, on religious icons and give them special uh, energy and therefore, uh, you know, do things that the human beings, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Uh, have done for uh, millenniums and millenniums, right? Uh, they propitiate the gods, right? Help me, intervene for me. And, uh, you know, people do that uh, too in, in, in kind of popular Buddhism. But uh, what, I, the, the, what I spoke to you first is really what it's about. I mean, the Buddha was, uh, uh, you know, I mean, when people would say to him, uh, when he was alive, you know, are you a god? You know, you know, what are you? And he would always say uh, simply, uh, I am awake. I am awake. That's all. So good. Thank you, Dean. Any other questions? Please don't be shy. Again, but, you know, uh, please remember that um, uh, Buddhism uh, was in Asia for, as we said, 2,600 years. So it, it, many symbols that were in cultures were then taken and given new meaning. Uh, uh, the lotus is a very um, popular uh, 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 image in, uh, in Buddhism. Uh, it is a beautiful flower. And if you go to Asia, uh, lotus pools, lotus gardens are very common. You know, you see lots of that uh, uh, everywhere. But in Buddhist temples and everything, they like to have lotus gardens. But the lotus has a unique uh, meaning uh, for Buddhism, besides just that it's a beautiful uh, thing. Because uh, the lotus, uh, we see, uh, when we look in the pond, we see this beautiful flower right, uh, on the water. Uh, what we don't see is what? What it's rooted in. And what it's rooted in is muck. You know, yuck. Mud. You know, I mean, that's, that's what it's rooted in. So it has this uh, strange capacity that it, it, it is rooted, which means it gets its nourishment from muck, <laughs> from yucky muck. <laughs> Stuff we don't like to step into. We step in the muck and it squishes and it feels yucky. People don't like it. Uh, and yet this beautiful uh, lotus, this beautiful flower is rooted in it and out of it uh, grows uh, out of this muck. This muck is, this yuck muck uh, is transformed into this beautiful flower. So what is so that's that really is why it's such a meaningful symbol for for practice, uh, because uh, many of us uh, or most of us, uh, all of us, uh, when we begin uh, our real uh, serious uh, spiritual life, uh, seeking for uh, transformation, seeking to flower, right? seeking to flower to really flower as a human being, uh, we begin where we're in the mud. We're in the muck. That's the truth, you know, where our minds still are filled with afflictive emotions. We're still up and down. We still have all kinds of misperceptions. We're still, you know, all, all over the place, right? We're, we're in the mud. You know, our mind is still very neurotic, you know, all, all this stuff, okay? So that's the mud. And if you don't understand the capacity that the mud of human afflictions, the mud of human and sufferings, has the potential for, for, for transformation and becoming its opposite, right? You know, again, you, you, if you just came across the swamp and the muck, 
you would say, y you know, yuck, let me, let me go somewhere else. But if you understand the capacity uh, to grow lotuses in the mud, you go, wonderful, right? Muck is the perfect environment to grow lotuses, right? Okay. Which means uh, it is our misperceptions, it is our suffering, it is our own uh, pain and suffering and misdirection uh, that fuels, that fuels, that nourishes our desire to awaken and be free. Right? So that is why we should never, we should never bemoan what has occurred in our life. We should never bemoan, why did this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? We should never get into that place of, oh, I'm so screwed up, I'm so neurotic, I'm such a mess. Uh, you know, uh, I could never, you know, uh, you know, become a person of, uh, of, of beauty. You know, I could never be happy. I could never uh, really be open-hearted. I could really never be free. We would never say that because we understand that within the muck, the lotus flower grows. Nowhere else, right? Where do Buddhas come from? They come from people like us. They don't come from anywhere else. They don't come from the sky, right? They don't come from the sky. Buddhas appear from the mud. Of, of, of life. So it's a very uh, powerful, uh, powerful metaphor, the lotus in the mud. Good. Uh, <laughs> are there, are there uh, any other questions? Yes. In the uh, recitation after the walking meditation, mm -hmm. the reference to the superior to Tom, complex, the inferior complex, and the equality. Yeah, what is that? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Uh, usually when we hear that, we go, yeah. So the question is, uh, uh, in the recitation before the Dharma talk, there is the mention of the uh, superiority, inferiority, and equality complex. I would imagine the superiority and the inferiority complex, uh, you understand. That is, that is, uh, you know, that is in our Western psychological vernacular, right? We, we speak of people who have a superiority complex. They think they're better than everybody else. And then there are those who have inferiority complexes. They think they're worse than every, everybody. You know, on, here, on one side there are people going, I'm better than everybody else. And then there's other people on the other side who are going, I'm worse than everybody else. So they're, they're kind of made for each other, right? I mean, it's kind of a wonderful uh, uh, mirroring, you know? And I guess if they run into each other in life, uh, uh, they could create a, a quite happy relationship. Uh, uh, if there weren't other problems with those uh, complexes. Uh, it is the equality complex that, that we, uh, that kind of, I think, throws us, right? Because uh, equality sounds pretty good to us, right? I mean, we, we think that's what it's all about. Uh, so this is not the equality of equal rights or justice for all. This is not that equality. Uh, and, what, and what that verse is talking to is really a key point of Buddhist psychology and understanding is uh, that intrinsically, the sense that human beings have of their selfhood, of their ego, of their, that I'm a me, and this complete identification as a self, as a me, as an ego, uh, is the root in Buddhist psychology, is the root of our suffering. It is what separates us and what causes us to stand out side of, of human experience and, and others and, and look at life and relate to life from a certain kind of stance. It's not an openness, because there is this blockage with these com complexes, this complexity of self. And so what's talked about is, when it says, may I be free of all the, compl it's really saying, may I be free of all those complexes that self generates, right? 
because of causes and conditions, uh, your self-made generators, I'm better than everybody else, right? I should be first online, right? I should win the lottery, right? I mean, I should get the raise, right? I, sh I, sh I, I, I shouldn't be caught in traffic, right? Because I'm somehow better than, you know? And then the other side, there are those who go, you know, look, no matter what happens, it's always me, right? Just, I, I, I must deserve it, right? I'm always the one last in line. I'm always the one stuck in traffic. I'm always the one that gets passed over. There's something must be just intrinsically wrong with me, right? But then there are the, the equality, which is the interesting one, which is, means, well, I'm as good as you, right? You know, I'm as good as you. I should be, uh, you know, you know, why should you get that? I get that. It's not, it's not from a stance of superior, like it should all come to me, but it's sort of like, uh, I'm as worthy as you. But the truth is, we're not, are we? Right? Some people are smarter than us. Right? And some people aren't. Some people are more competent than us, and some people aren't. Right? Some people have better fortune than us. Right? Some don't. Right? So, the equality complex, I think, really eliminates all uh, jealousy. You know, it's, it's willing to live in the world and understand uh, that we are not all equal, right? Somebody win, will win the Oscars, right? I mean, you could debate the worthiness of it, but the bottom line is uh, somebody will win it, won't they, in each category. Because in, in the world of things as they are, uh, choices are made. Right? Somebody may, you know, you go into the supermarket and lots of choices, right? Just because you choose one, it does not mean that the other is necessarily bad. But it also doesn't mean they're all equal, right? Are all cereals equal? No. They're different. <laughs> liberate cereals. So, <laughs> so, so it's, it's really a very uh, key point when it says, you know, may we be liberated. It means can we be liberated from all those views we have of ourself, which cause us so much suffering, right? Because uh, the one who thinks they're better than you know, uh, you know, I, everything should come to me, uh, I should always be first, uh, I'm the best, uh, you know, uh, I'm smarter than, handsomer than, than, than you know, uh, and the one who's over on the opposite side, and the one who's always, uh, you know, why not me, why not me, why not me, always jealous and always envious, uh, all those are causes of suffering. None of those people are happy. None of those people are happy. And they're all separate from each other. They're all encased in their complexes of who they think they are and how they think life should be for them. And, right? We want to free ourselves of all that. We want to be open and free. So may I be free of all those neurotic complexes of self that I've always identified with. Is that? Yeah, so that's what that's about. Any other, any other uh, questions? Yes. Yes, Evelyn. <laughs> so that's a, that the question is, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's really a two-part question. I mean, you, you snuck in the real meaning here. So the, the first part was, you know, Westerners, we sit in chairs. Is there a purpose in, in sitting on cushions uh, the way we do? And then you added it, and especially when it is painful. <laughs> Does that even give us uh, more reason? So again, uh, you know, the Buddhist tradition, the meditative tradition uh, is really coming to us from Asia. In Asia, traditionally, uh, uh, 
uh, sitting, well, well again, it's, it is true that, that these, these were cultures where people did sit more on the ground, you know, just cross-legged or on small little cushions or whatever, uh, you know, so uh, people were more uh, used to sitting on the ground just socially uh, with each other, and uh, meditators, when they sat on the ground, obviously to take a posture like the lotus posture, uh, where you, where your legs and knees are locked in and you have this solid base, right? It's a very solid base and a very uh, a unified kind of posture because the extremities, the legs and the arms are all kind of brought together. So uh, it has been uh, traditionally thought uh, that uh, learning to sit you know, in some sort of lotus posture uh, in which the body uh, is immovable, quiet, uh, is an aid to quieting and calming the mind. Okay. Uh, and having uh, grown up in the West, uh, always sitting in chairs, and uh, learning to uh, sit on the floor in a cushion, uh, I can agree that there is something uh, very special on, on sitting by oneself on the ground uh, in this stable, solid posture, uh, not leaning on anything uh, upright uh, is, is, I think, quite wonderful. But having said that, that does not mean that one cannot stabilize the mind, <laughs> calm the mind and come to full enlightenment, uh, not sitting in a chair. I mean, I mean, I mean not sitting on a cushion. Okay, so, so uh, this is just a tradition, okay. but is it, is it essential? No, because, of, because the most essential thing in, in, in meditation, the meditation has to do with the mind, right? There is a belief, again, that stabilizing and quieting the body uh, helps quiet the mind. It's a, it's a, it's a further step. It's a, it's a good step toward, uh, but as those of you who are sitting in chairs know, uh, that can also be done in a chair or on a bench or whatever. So, uh, uh, as for pain, um, you know, I think in, in relationship to learning, uh, if you want to make the uh, transition about just learning, what, if one, uh, you, know, you know, what it's like uh, to sit uh, on the ground uh, in a posture. And again, uh, the, you will notice uh, that uh, traditionally in India, uh, where you, when you see people sit in lotuses, they or posture meditation, they usually don't have anything underneath them. They usually sit uh, on the ground. Uh, cushions sort of developed as Buddhism spread. Uh, so if you go to uh, uh, Chinese uh, Zen temples, you'll you'll find smaller cushions. These larger ones, uh, you tend to find more uh, in the in the Japanese and Korean tradition. I mean, I don't know why. And again, that is because uh, the cushion gets your butt up. It gets your butt up. When your butt gets up, your knees go down. And you want to have, you know, you don't want to be off balance. You don't want to do any damage to your uh, spine. So the cushion, uh, uh, by getting your butt up and getting your knees down, uh, kind of increases the stability that uh, for most of us, without the cushion, we'd kind of be like that, or our knees would be up, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so getting more height underneath it. Uh, again, uh, because we don't grow up uh, a city on the floor, uh, for most of us, uh, it is a, an exercise in a certain degree of uncomfortableness uh, sitting on the uh, ground. Uh, and that's just, uh, I would say, at that level, uh, it is just something uh, that we go through, right? Like, like uh, probably other kinds of physical uh, activities that we may uh, uh, exercise activities or other types of things that in the short run, uh, in, in, you know, before we are fully stretched and, and whatever, uh, we, we may find, uh, gr you know, more uncomfortability slash a little bit of pain, uh, but over time, right, uh, uh, we will decrease. Uh, so again, there is a certain degree of uncomfortableness that usually we will encounter uh, if we are wanting to make the transition uh, to sitting uh, on the ground. Uh, again, it should not be excruciating pain. Uh, that's not what this is about. 
again, I'm speaking from my own experience. Again, now, I mean, I, I began my meditative tradition uh, in a very sort of austere <laughs> Uh, tradition uh, where uh, everybody was uh, subtly, if not uh, oh, very overtly, encouraged to sit uh, on the ground uh, uh, on cushions uh, in the lotus posture. And uh, moving was not allowed. Once you took the posture until the end of the round at 35 40 minutes, you were not allowed uh, to move. Uh, if you moved uh, the monitor, uh, this would be this lady over here, would go, No moving. <laughs> That would echo through the meditation hall, <laughs> striking fear into the, uh, into the participants. Uh, so to be honest with you, uh, my learning how to meditate and sit in the lotus posture uh, was incredibly excruciatingly painful. I mean, I, I think I probably spent the first year uh, praying uh, for the bell. <laughs> which is a little bit of a distraction, but uh, <laughs> so I think that was a little extreme. But on the other hand, uh, speaking in favor of, of uh, that is, you know, I, again, speaking as a, as a good American, uh, we do not do well with discomfort, do we? We don't like to be uncomfortable, <laughs> right? If it's a little too warm, we want to put the AC down. If it's a little too cool, we want to put it up, right? We, I mean, you know, we pop pills for everything, right? I mean, you know, stomach a little of this, take of that. Headache a little bit of this, take of that. I mean, we do not like discomfort. We like to be comfortable. Uh, again, which is, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Except for many people, it is uh, obsessive because our, our, our suffering when we are uncomfortable uh, is really quite disturbing to our calmness and well-being, right? In other words, we seem to, uh, as we've acculturated uh, over these, uh, these past years, decades, uh, we become uh, less and less able to endure any type of uh, discomfort or unpleasantness, and more and more we look for quick fixes, right? Uh, I think that is uh, dangerous. Dangerous just in our own uh, capacity as human beings to, uh, uh, to be comfortable and adaptable to life. Uh, you know, it's often uncomfortable. Has anybody ever noticed that? I don't know, you know, I mean, things, there are, there are, you know, there's lots of just uncomfortable situations we get into, not just the weather or, or climate or, or, or physical discomforts or, you know, personal discomforts, situations we're in. And uh, we want to learn how to deal with these things uh, by relaxing and opening rather than uh, shutting down, making incredible dramas or needing an uh, instant uh, fix. You know, what I learned uh, in those early years of my Zen training was no matter how excruciating it was and no matter, 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 no matter what drama I was making about the damage that I was doing irreparably to my body or no matter how much uh, begging or mental hatred I uh, directed toward the bellmaster <laughs> or, how, or how many, uh, uh, you know, uh, asking Dean, you know, how many times I invoked the Buddhas to please, and you know, could you just move the clock a little bit, of, you know? <laughs> when the round ended and I unfolded my legs, everything was immediately okay. And that whole big drama that I had uh, distracted myself with was nothing but my own creation. And that's a, that's a good learning. So... Uh, as I say, when I look back at those early years, I certainly see uh, it was extreme uh, because it did border on a little bit of uh, pain for the sake of pain and, and it, it kind of uh, evolved into kind of a macho kind of uh, practice, you know. Everybody was toughing their way through it and more focused on how tough they were than uh, uh, how realized they were, uh, which is backwards. Uh, but again, uh, I can see the benefits from having gone through that. Uh, 
So again, in terms of those of you who uh, are learning to uh, sit uh, on the floor, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to learn from uh, discomfort. And meaning, watch your, watch your mind. You know, I mean, what are we experiencing? Sensations in our knees, right? That's all. Sensations in our back or neck, I mean, they're not killing us, are they? No. They're, they're uncomfortable sensations in most of the cases. And watch what your mind does with it. The stories it creates, how you become totally focused and obsessive about it. And how rather than learning how to relax and open, to give it space, we narrow and constrict, which makes it only worse. And we do, and we do that with our with this physical discomfort, but we even as well do it with our uh, emotional and mental discomfort. We're in an uncomfortable situation. There's an uncomfortable interaction, or something. And what do we do? Obsess about it, right? Obsess about it, rather than relaxing, creating space around it so it can just pass through. We fasten onto it, make it the focus of our attention, and make ourselves miserable. So, please understand, sitting on the cushion, <laughs> sitting in meditation, there's a lot to be learned on the journey. If you just watch yourself, see how you respond. Right? See the drama that you create. See the emotions uh, that arise. So, uh, it's only for the brave. <laughs> 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 any, any other questions?